Hey listeners, before we get into the episode today, I just want to let you know that we are going to postpone our upcoming event on Bicycle Day, April 19th, 2020 in downtown Salt Lake City in light of the COVID-19 known as the coronavirus outbreak. If you want more information and details on that, listen to the show after the main segment. Let's go ahead and get into it. I am Ryan McKnight. I'm Kara Santa Maria. I am Christopher Smith. Hi, I'm Andrew Torres. This, this is Naked Mormonism. Mormonism, the Serial Mormon History Podcast. The Fosters, the Higbees, and the Laws in May of 1844. Listener, do you know why we're talking about these people? Last week, we discussed the Fosters, how Charles and Robert had become affiliated with the church, their leadership positions, and, of course, how Robert came into increasing degrees of conflict with the prophet in very public fora, both at the pulpit and in the Nauvoo courtroom. Today, we're going to tackle the Higby brothers, Francis and Chauncey. Now, there were many Higbees associated with Mormonism from the Kirtland era of the church. The whole family of parents Elias and Sarah and children Francis Marion, Chauncey Lawson, Andrew Jackson, and DeWitt Clinton joined the church in 1832. Francis at this time was 12 years old and Chauncey was 11. Notably, these weren't the only Higbees to convert to the church in 1832, as Elias' brothers, Isaac and John, and sisters Mary Higby and Mary Denham, had all joined the church around the same time as well. The Higby family was actually quite large, and they brought many people into the church when it was in its infant stages in Kirtland. The Higbees also enjoyed varying degrees of church leadership, but since we're only really focusing on Francis and Chauncey, let's dig into these guys. Francis and Chauncey in 1832 were still young enough to be, you know, like kind of toted around by their parents, Elias and Sarah. Now, Elias and Sarah took their sons to Jackson County, Missouri in 1833. That's where they moved the family as tensions between the Missourians and the Mormons began to boil. They arrived very soon before the Missourians kicked the Mormons out of Jackson County and the entire Mormon population was forced into Clay County and the counties surrounding it. It wasn't just Elias and Sarah who took their kids with them to Jackson County. The Mormon population out there was growing very quickly and land was, well, cheap or kind of free, sort of, a little bit. All of the Higby families moved to Missouri in 1833, only to be kicked out of Jackson County soon after their arrival. They were all forced into Clay and DeWitt and the surrounding counties because of all of the troubles the Mormons experienced with the Missourians. At the age of 15, one of our Higby brothers, up for discussion, Francis, struck out on his own and moved back to Kirtland for a very brief period. Now, what actually brought him back to Geauga County, Ohio, after his family had moved to Missouri? That's kind of a source of mystery, but informed speculation would postulate that the dude was old enough to work on the Kirtland Temple. And the Kirtland Temple in 1835 was in its final stages of construction, and all able-bodied young men were petitioned by the church leadership to chip in resources or labor. Francis's younger brother, Chauncey, seems to have remained in Missouri with the rest of the family during this time period that Francis moved back to Kirtland. After the construction of the Kirtland Temple and the dedication ceremony in early 1836, Francis, at age 16, returned to Missouri to remain with his family. Now, the age division between Chauncey and Francis continued to divide their activities in Missouri. Francis, being only a year older than Chauncey, granted him access to plenty of activities required by the Mormon leadership. While Chauncey was most likely helping his family with like menial hired labor, the older Francis took on responsibilities in the Mormon empire building process. When Joe was removed from church leadership in Kirtland in 1838 and fled to the Missouri Mormon settlements, Francis Higby joined the cause of the one true prophet. Now, while an actual role of the Danites doesn't exist, 
Historians bicker about who were and weren't members of the actual Danites. Now, D. Michael Quinn claims that basically all members of the Mormon militia during 1838, that was known as the Army of Israel, that basically all of them were Danites. And of course, Danites, that's people who are members of the underground shadow enforcement militia. Other historians disagree with Quinn by asserting that membership in the Danites was actually a higher ranking circle of the Army of Israel, and only select members of the Army of Israel were also members of the Danites. While there isn't really a solid bedrock to stand on with this issue, the point remains that the Mormons formed their own militias in Missouri without government approval, leading to the charges of high treason after the Mormon settlements surrendered in the first part of November 1838. Francis Higby was a member of one or both of these organizations, and I would postulate that he was likely a Danite, and my evidence for that is as follows— The Danite Manifesto was signed in June of 1838, and that gave Oliver Cowdery, David and John Whitmer, and William Wines, Double Dub Phelps, three days to leave Caldwell County. The manifesto bears the signatures of 83 men. Two of those men are Francis's uncles, Isaac and John S. Higby. Further, during the same testimony from Dr. Samson Avard, the defector whose testimony kind of led to the Mormon extermination order and the arrest of Jonah's cronies, Dr. Samson Avard referred to the Mormon depredations of non-Mormon settlements in Davies County, and in this statement, he directly named the participants of the pillaging and burning posses, quote, The following of the defendants were in the last expedition, the depredation expedition, to Davies County. And then he lists a bunch of names, but only include a few. Joseph Smith Jr., Hiram Smith, Parley P. Pratt, Lyman White, Alexander McCray. And of course, those were the guys in Sidney Rigdon who were locked up in Liberty Jail together. John S. Higby, Edward Partridge, and Francis Higby, end quote. So Francis Higby was named alongside his uncle in an explicitly Danite robbing campaign during October of 1838. Apparently, being 18 years old, Francis Higby was old enough to participate as a militant Mormon during this Missouri Mormon conflict. He was among the dozens of Mormons who were arrested and tried during the November Court of Inquiry, largely due to Samson Avard and Thomas B. Marsh naming Francis Higby directly in connection with the extra military activities of the Mormon leadership. During this Missouri Mormon War of 1838, Chauncey Higby was only 16 to 17 years old, likely making him ineligible to participate at anything more than maybe like being a message courier or something. Of the 53 men who were charged for the initial crimes of, quote, high treason against the state, murder, burglary, arson, robbery, and larceny, end quote, only the six in Liberty Jail and about a dozen others remain imprisoned for the months following the war, concomitant with the Mormon expulsion from Missouri to Illinois. Francis Higby and the other two Higbys arraigned in the court of inquiry for this investigative trial were all released by the end of November in order to return to their families and assist the Quorum of Apostles during the exodus to Illinois. By spring of 1839, all of the Higbys, Chauncey and Francis included, were located in Illinois, first in the initial landing spot in Adams County, a little town called Quincy, and then to Hancock County in what was known as Commerce at the time, but soon would be called Nauvoo. Now, once John C. Reckett Bennett, we talked about him a lot, joined the refugee settlement of Nauvoo and helped pass the Nauvoo Charter through the Illinois legislature, both Chauncey and Francis Higby were appointed aides-de-camp of Major General John C. Bennett during the formation of the Nauvoo Legion. Now, an aide-de-camp is essentially like a special position as a direct assistant to a high-ranking officer. Aides-de-camp are rarely expected to participate in military conflict. Their role is more in counseling and grunt work of like running messages or, you know, handling confidential paperwork for that high-ranking officer. Understandably, As both Higby brothers were aides-de-camp to John C. Reckett Bennett, that meant they were of relatively high rank in the Nauvoo Legion, or at least they were, you know, kind of favored by the highest-ranking officers of Bennett and Joseph Smith. And at this time, life was good for Francis and Chauncey Higby. 
They were gainfully employed. They were making ends meet. They likely found nice women to court during social occasions during which they could elect to attend their, you know, these occasions in their Nauvoo Legion uniforms for extra attention or if they were on personal bodyguard duty of the Prophet or John Bennett. Both Higby brothers, in addition to their father and uncles, enjoyed leadership and board member roles in Nauvoo. Elias Higby, their father, was on the board of trustees of the University of Nauvoo, as well as on the board of regents. And, you know, the board of regents helped to determine who gained access to the University of Nauvoo, as well as the curriculum for it. Now, Isaac and Elias Higby, you know, brothers, uh, Isaac, of course, is uncle to Chauncey and Francis. They were also on the board of the Nauvoo Agricultural and Manufacturing Association. All of the Higby men were plugged into Nauvoo government at different levels, in addition to being conscripted into the Nauvoo Legion. Now, here's a brief point of clarification to kind of get the familial lines clear. Isaac Higby Sr. and Elias Higby were the Higby brothers who converted with their entire families to the church in the early 1830s. Isaac had a child named after him. Isaac Sr. died during the Mormon expulsion from Missouri in early 1839. All the Isaac Higbees we see in Nauvoo are actually Isaac Jr., who was cousin of Francis and Chauncey that we're talking about today. Francis and Chauncey's uncle, Isaac Sr., had died in 1839, but their father, Elias, is still present in Nauvoo documents until 1843, which we're going to discuss momentarily. So this was an era of good feelings at the very earliest stages of Nauvoo, but all good things must come to an end, lest the taste turn to ash in one's mouth, and the friendship between Racket Bennett and Lieutenant General Grandmaster King of Israel Joseph Smith soured. Bennett became aware of the assassination attempt by Pistol Pack and Porter Rockwell of former Missouri governor and senatorial candidate Lilburn Boggs, and Bennett decided that that was the breaking point. When Bennett broke away from the church, he drove a wedge in the Mormon community between the Joe Loyalists and the believers who believed Joe, uh, Bennett's allegations and they weren't pleased with the direction of the church and its leadership. The Higbees were caught up on the opposition side making them enemies to Joseph Smith. Francis Higby is named multiple times in Bennett's expose letters and the full book length history of the saints, which if you're a patron over at patreon.com slash naked Mormonism, you get that whole audiobook with my commentary. Francis Higby sided with Bennett during his public departure, as did Chauncey. Now, this is understandable because he and Chauncey were both aides to camp to Bennett, basically his personal assistants, they were friends with Reckett Bennett and thus became swept up in the character assassination campaign waged by Joe and his loyalists to try and damage control the Bennett meltdown. When Bennett first was excommunicated from the church and removed as mayor of Nauvoo, Francis M. Higby sent him a letter dated July 6th, 1842, giving Bennett a description of Joe's public melting down over Bennett's impending expose. Now, what is notable in this letter and another that we're going to read from Chauncey right after is the fact that the Higby brothers had essentially become Bennett's emissaries during his data collecting for the coming expose. Bennett couldn't spend much time in Nauvoo without being followed by the Danites, so he needed to work with people who were still there who weren't Joe loyalists. The Higbys worked with Bennett in collecting affidavits and running letters and talking to people whom they wanted to give statements to the facts. And then, you know, just kind of generally running errands for Bennett to collect information for History of the Saints. Others who weren't in the Joe Loyalist campaign soon became caught up in the smear campaign, including George W. Robinson and hingepin Sidney Rigdon. This is the letter from Francis Higby to John C. Bennett, quote, Dear Sir, Joseph Smith is yet thrashing about and tearing up the, here it says D with some grolics. So it doesn't, it, I don't know what the the word is and tearing up the Danites or te tearing up the damn town. I don't, I don't know what it, what he's actually saying there. 
Uh, but Francis continues and slandering everybody. He has not lit on Rigdon and Robinson very severely as yet, but touched them slightly on Sunday. Also myself. And we must keep things right side up. Mrs. Schindel's affidavit is a good one. And Mrs. G, it's just G with more asterisks. I have understood was going to give hers. Mrs. Pratt, I think that's Sarah Pratt, will also give hers. Also, Miss Nancy Rigdon. Joe is operating with Mrs. White, and it is reported that he is to settle upon her a fine sum soon or return the money that he and Sherman took from Bill White some time ago. You ought to see Mrs. White and labor with her as soon as possible and secure her testimony because it would be great. Emphasis is added there. As it respects my affidavit, sire, for good, for God's sake, my sake and the sake of my people, do not show it to anyone on earth as yet. Never until I give you liberty. Styles has seen it and you must swear him that he will keep it as dark as hell. I am yet true as death and intended to stick or die, but you must keep my name back because I am not ready as yet to leave. And as soon as you bring my name out, they ascertain to take my life. They go it like hell yet. I am likely to sell my property here, and as soon as I do, I will immigrate like lightning, scorch them with the Missouri writ. This is what scares them like the devil, porter not accepted. Your dear friend signed Francis M. Higby, end quote. Chauncey L. Higby also shared some correspondence with Reckett Bennett in a letter that stated just three days before his brother's previous letter that we just read from Chauncey Higby, quote, Dear Sir, I received your favor by Mr. Hamilton today and have done all in my power to accomplish your business according to your request. Then a bunch of stars, da 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 I have talked with Mrs. G, star, star, and labored hard to show her the necessity of coming out to befriend the innocent and defend her own character from Joe's foul aspersion. But she says that she will not give her affidavit now, but thinks that she will in the course of two or three days. She wants to have a talk with Orson Pratt before she gives it. I have seen Pratt, and he says if she comes to talk with him, he will tell her that if she knows anything to tell it, let it hit where it will. There were a great many out to meeting yesterday. Smith preached, said considerable against you, and stated that Mr. Robinson and Rigdon had requested him to recall what he had said against them. But instead of doing it, according to promise, he vilified them worse than ever, if it were possible to do it. No other names were mentioned, but he insinuated very hard on Francis in the forenoon and on myself in the afternoon by saying that those who had resigned were no better than yourself after placing you at the lowest grade he possibly could in his awkward way of doing it. I have seen Nancy Rigdon. She told me to say to you, go ahead and make her name as much as you please in related to the circumstances which happened between Smith and herself. Mr. Pratt and his wife say that if ever Smith renews the attack on them, they will come out against him and stand it no longer. Yours with respect, signed Chauncey L. Higby, end quote. The Higbys defecting from the loyalist camp and siding with Reckett Bennett here spelled disaster for Joe and his closest trusted elites. The Higbys had seen and participated in some of the most well-hidden meetings of the Mormon Empire, and Francis was very likely a Danite. Before the Bennett meltdown and his, you know, his resulting expose, History of the Saints, many Higbys were in line to be inducted into the Anointed Quorum and the Council of Fifty. However, with Chauncey and Francis Higby siding with Reckett Bennett, they would, from that time forward, be on the outs of the Nauvoo Inner Circle. Bennett continued to call upon both Higby brothers as sources of criminal conduct by the prophet. Later in his same expose, Bennett prints a number of Nauvoo financial records dealing with Joe's application for bankruptcy. You see, what happened here is Joe had to hide assets in order to qualify for bankruptcy status, which had only recently gone into effect for the state of Illinois. In order to hide those assets, Joe transferred a number of them to Emma and to his children for as little as a dollar per lot or deed. As a precursor to the section in this chapter of Bennett's book, he writes this, quote, The bankrupt law, section 2, provides that no conveyance of property shall be made in contemplation of bankruptcy, end quote. Then Bennett 
prints some correspondence and relevant documents to show that Joe had violated the statutes of the bankruptcy laws. After he prints those, he states, quote, If an official certificate is required, call upon Chauncey Robinson Esquire, the recorder of Hancock, and he will certify that these are correct extracts from the county records. There are various other matters of record that could be made to operate against this king of swindlers and impostors, Joe Smith, but I presume that the foregoing will be sufficient to give him a comfortable home in the state penitentiary at Alton for some years to come if Missouri does not get him first. If oral testimony is required, call upon General George W. Robinson, Colonel Francis M. Higby, and others who are acquainted with the transactions, end quote. You see, both Francis and Chauncey Higby were crucial to Reckitt Bennett's information collection for his 1842 expose letters and his full-length book, History of the Saints. It was through the Higby brothers that Bennett was capable of acquiring one of the most consequential letters in all of Nauvoo Mormon history, known as the Happiness Letter, among many other documents, of course. Now, one point which drove Joe and Hingepin Sidney Rigdon apart was Joe's lust for Rigdon's second daughter, Nancy. We discussed her and the Happiness Letter back on episode 117 of the show. But essentially, Joe approached Nancy Rigdon in order to teach her about the doctrine of polygamy. To put it simply, She rejected his advances, and he sent her a letter, which Whiteout Willie Richards delivered in hand. The letter gets its name from the first words of, quote, Happiness is the object and design of our existence and will be the end thereof if we pursue the path that leads to it, end quote. That's why it's called the happiness letter. But after that, the letter goes on to say, quote, Our Heavenly Father is more liberal in his views and boundless in his mercies and blessings than we are ready to believe or receive, adding, Everything that God gives us is lawful and right, and it is proper that we should enjoy his gifts and blessings, end quote. And of course, this is all written in the context of trying to convince Nancy Rigdon to accept Joe's polygamy proposal and to keep it secret, especially from her father, Sidney Rigdon. Now, what's extremely notable about this proposal was the extent to which Francis Higby was knowledgeable and involved in this Nancy Rigdon proposal situation, according to Bennett anyway, so take that with a grain of salt. According to Bennett, when Joe's messenger, Whiteout Willard Richards, first approached Nancy and told her to meet with the prophet, Joe wasn't able to make the meeting, but sensing that something was amiss, Bennett went to a friend that he could trust. Francis Higby, whom Bennett instructed to immediately go to Nancy and tell her what Joe had in store once the meeting happened. From History of the Saints, quote, Dr. Willard Richards, however, one of the holy twelve Mormon apostles and spiritual high priests and pandered general for lust, whom I had long suspected as being up to his eyes in the business with Joe, came in and said, Miss Nancy, Joseph cannot be in today. Please call again on Thursday. This she agreed to do, but she communicated the matter to Colonel Francis M. Higby, who was addressing her, and asked his advice as to the second visit. I then came to a knowledge of the facts and went immediately to Joe and said to him, Joseph, you are a master mason and Nancy is a master mason's daughter. So is Mrs. Pratt, the daughter of Mr. Bates. So stay your hand or you will get into trouble. Remember your obligation. Joe replied, You are my enemy and wish to oppose me. I, this is meaning John C. Bennett, I then went to Colonel Francis M. Higby and told him Joe's designs and requested him to go immediately and see Miss Rigdon and tell her the infernal plot that Joe would approach her in the name of the Lord by special revelation, etc., and to put her on her guard, but advise her to go and see for herself what Joe would do. He did so, and she went down, end quote. Because Francis Higby had warned Nancy Rigdon, she was prepared for Joe when he subsequently locked her in the room and tried to force himself on her. She told him that she would cry out for help, and he relented. Nancy Rigdon was one of the lucky ones when it came to Joe's advances. After this refusal is when Joe sent her the happiness letter, which instructed her to burn it after reading. 
Now, we have very few pieces of paper in Joe's actual handwriting, and his frequent burn after reading instructions are partially to blame for that fact. Needless to say, according to Reckett Bennett, if not for Francis Higby, we may not have the text of the happiness letter today. Quote, The original of which is a literal copy, this is written after he reprints the entire happiness letter, in the handwriting of Dr. Richards is now in my possession. It was handed me by Colonel Francis M. Higby in the presence of General George W. Robinson, end quote. Also in the presence of George W. Robinson, Francis Higby told Recca Bennett about Joe's plot to assassinate Bennett. When Bennett first began to reveal his grand designs, according to Bennett, Joe brought him into the Nauvoo Masonic Lodge. And this was the scene as reported by John Bennett. Quote, We, meaning Joseph and Bennett during this confrontation, we entered and he locked the door, put the key in his pocket, drew a pistol on me and said, the peace of my family requires that you should sign an affidavit and make a statement before the next city council, exonerating me from all participation, whatever, in word or deed in the spiritual wife doctrine or private intercourse with females in general. And if you do not do it with apparent cheerfulness, I will make catfish bait out of you or deliver you over to the Danites for execution tonight. For my dignity and purity must and shall be maintained before the public, even at the expense of my life. Your die is cast. Your fate is fixed. Your doom is sealed if you refuse. He then unlocked the door. We went into the room below, and I gave the affidavit as subscribed before General Daniel H. Wells. I was not aware until the Sunday after my return from Springfield that any other person was apprised of the fact of the threat of murder. But on that day, Colonel Francis M. Higby told me in the presence of General George W. Robinson that he was in possession of a secret that would open the eyes of the people and that if it came to the worst, he would file his affidavit, but he would not then tell me what that secret was. General Robinson, however, informed me afterwards that it was a knowledge of Joe's threats of murder and the duress, end quote. And indeed, Francis M. Higby made an affidavit before Alderman Hiram Kimball, not Hebrew the Creeper Kimball, but Hiram Kimball, definitely different guys in every conceivable way. In that affidavit, Francis Higby stated, quote, that Joseph Smith told him that John C. Bennett could be easily put aside or drowned and no person would be the wiser for it and that it ought to be attended to. And he further remarked that the sooner this was done, the better for the church, fearing, as he said, that Bennett would make some disclosures prejudicial to said Smith, end quote. Without these affidavits, Governor Carlin, the outgoing governor of Illinois preceding Governor Thomas Ford, wouldn't have had the necessary affidavits in order to sign an arrest warrant for Joseph Smith, which forced Joe and Pistol Pack and Port into hiding for the last six months of 1842. And it wasn't just Francis Higby caught up in the whole scandal helping Reckett Bennett. Chauncey Higby also cast in his lot with the dissenting voices at this time. He sent a letter to Bennett, which Bennett printed in his expose, which provides some interesting context and alludes to specific tasks that Bennett had given to Chauncey Higby to carry out while Bennett was away from Nauvoo for his own safety. This letter was written on August 14, 1842, when Porter had fled the city of Nauvoo for Indiana, escaping the law, and Joe was in hiding in places around and in Nauvoo. Now, Port and Joe were both wanted by Governors Reynolds of Missouri and Governor uh, Carlin of Illinois for attempting to assassinate Lilburn Boggs. This is what Chauncey Higby said to Bennett, quote, I cannot believe for a moment that you have forgotten a person who has stood by you as I have done, both in prosperity and exile. For I assure you, doctor, that I shall never forsake or forget you, nor the scenes through which we have passed together. There is quite a rip up in our city this week. A demand has been made by Governor Reynolds of Missouri on the affidavit of ex-Governor Boggs for O.P. Rockwell and Joseph Smith, on which demand Governor Carlin last Saturday issued his writ, end quote. Then Chauncey Higby uh, goes through the arrest of Porter uh, and Joe by Marshals Pittman and King, the filing for a writ of habeas corpus, and then the marshals refusing to honor the writ of habeas corpus and appealing to the circuit court at Carthage. At that point, 
Joe and Port were released <laughs> and given over to the constable in Nauvoo by, quote, making some Masonic pledges to the officers to deliver himself and Rockwell up at any time when called for, end quote. That didn't work because both of them went into hiding immediately after being released by the marshals. So, you know, the, 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 those guys could go get an arrest warrant to override the Nauvoo writ of habeas corpus that initially released them. Now, Chauncey Higby, among everybody else, suspected that Joe and Port were hiding somewhere in town, even though Hiram sidekick of Smith, Joe's older brother, had stated from the pulpit that they were headed to England. Chauncey Higby also adds the interesting detail that, quote, the prophet prophesied on the stand about four weeks since that Bennett never would have influence enough to get a demand made for him. But alas, he has at this late hour realized his mistake, end quote. Chauncey Higby wraps up his letter by capturing the general feeling around Nauvoo about the Bennett and Joe Smith war that was going on, asking Bennett to return to Nauvoo, quote, Your friends here are firm and desire to see you very much. Your presence is now required in the West, and I advise you to come immediately on. Your presence would give fresh courage to your friends and a zest to the whole proceedings that could not be otherwise inspired. Napoleon should be in the field. I have scrupulously attended to the business which you confided to my care. All the friends desire to be respectfully remembered to you. Your friend signed Chauncey L. Higby, end quote. The Bennett meltdown was a storm that Joe could not keep contained. He was forced into hiding while his enemies continued to roam the streets of Nauvoo without much fear. Bennett was the head of the snake, but his being cut off from the church and Nauvoo society revealed that the descent problem in Nauvoo was more hydra than snake. Bennett made a lot of friends, and by virtue, Joe made a lot of enemies when he left and he published his expose, History of the Saints, and his initial expose letters in the Sangamo Journal. Those folks who helped Bennett could never be fully trusted again by the remaining loyalist leadership. While Joe was in hiding, his quorum of apostles and closest counselors engaged in damage control. The media outside of Nauvoo caught hold of the story of Bennett's articles in the Singapore Journal, and they were republished all across the nation. A contemporary commentator and sober critic of the Nauvoo church, Tom Ass Coke Sharp of the Warsaw Signal, we talk about him a lot on the show, received corroboration of Bennett's allegations from Francis Higby and others printing this article in the August 6th, 1842 edition of the Warsaw Signal. Quote, The testimony of General Bennett then has force and effect when taken in connection with that of Dr. Avard, William Wines Phelps, and others as given before the Court of Inquiry in Missouri, and the direct corroborations of Colonel Francis Higby and Miss Martha H. Brotherton all go to show the point arrived at, viz. that Joe Smith is a most consummate villain and knave. End quote. The Higbys, unlike Bennett, chose to remain in Nauvoo. This is the point in Nauvoo history where Francis and Chauncey Higby's trajectories depart very briefly only to arrive at the same location by May of 1844. Francis remained in good standing in the church and as a colonel in the Nauvoo Legion. Chauncey Higby, however, became a public target of Joseph Smith's character assassination campaign. Now, Joe was chaos spiraling out of control during the second half of 1842, and unfortunately, Chauncey suffered the collateral damage. Francis moved to a town called Pleasant Hill in Pike County, Illinois, probably in an effort to get away from the Danites because he was an enemy of the church. But Chauncey remained in Nauvoo, but he was excommunicated from the church. The details of Chauncey Higby's excommunication are absolutely fascinating. Shortly after Rekha Bennett's excommunication and removal as mayor, yet before Chauncey Higby and Bennett shared all of their letter correspondences as reported in Bennett's History of the Saints, Chauncey Higby was charged by the Nauvoo High Council, the ecclesiastical body, for unchristian-like conduct with women. Of course, as was the case with every case brought before Joe and his cronies, 
witnesses were produced, which paint a picture of Chauncey Higby as a horrible character. A couple of brief extracts, quote, testimony of Margaret J. Nyman. Sometime during the month of March last, Chauncey L. Higby came to my mother's house early one evening and proposed a walk to a spelling school. My sister, Matilda, and myself accompanied him, but changing our design on the way, we stopped at Mrs. Fuller's. During the evening's interview, he, as I have since learned, with wicked lies, proposed that I should yield to his desires and indulge in sexual intercourse with him, stating that such intercourse might be freely indulged in and was no sin." that any respectable female might indulge in sexual intercourse and there was no sin in it, providing the person so indulging, keep the same to herself, for there could be no sin where there was no accuser. And most clandestinely, with wicked lies, persuaded me to yield by using the name of Joseph Smith, and as I have since learned, totally false and unauthorized, and in consequence of those arguments, I was influenced to yield to my seducer, Chauncey L. Higby. I further state that I have no personal acquaintance with Joseph Smith and never heard him teach such doctrines as stated by Chauncey L. Higby, either directly or indirectly. I heartily repent before God, asking the forgiveness of my brethren. Signed, Margaret J. Nyman. End quote. A similar affidavit was made by Margaret's sister, Matilda, stating additionally, quote, I yielded and become the subject to the will of my seducer, Chauncey L. Higby, and having since found out to my satisfaction that a number of wicked men have conspired to use the name of Joseph Smith or the heads of the church falsely and wickedly to enable them to gratify their lusts, thereby destroying female innocence and virtue, I repent before God and my brethren and ask forgiveness, end quote. Matilda also testified, quote, that I never had any personal acquaintance with Joseph Smith and never heard him teach such doctrines as Higby stated either directly or indirectly, end quote. Really remarkable consistency there. There's another testimony against Chauncey L. Higby from Sarah Miller and yet another one from Catherine Warren, and all of them told essentially the same exact story, that Higby told them that there was no sin in sexual intercourse if the women kept it to themselves, and that he had the prophet's approval, and that none of them have personally known Joseph Smith. The remarkable consistency in these statements, even down to the terms that each of the women used, is highly suspicious when we consider the timing of the hearing and who the witnesses were. You see, Bennett is repeatedly named as the originator of this idea, the spiritual wifery system, and Joe's name is completely exonerated in every single statement. It almost reads as if all of the witnesses were instructed as to exactly what they needed to say on the stand before they took the stand and testified. But the splash damage from these testimonies hits Joe too, right? Let's not mince words here. Joe was pulling the strings to paint Reckett Bennett in a bad light at the end of May of 1842 when this hearing took place. The fact that Chauncey Higby was excommunicated from the church as a result of this hearing sheds a brighter light on the damaged control Joe and his cronies were utilizing to keep Bennett's salacious accusations from actually landing. However, Anything that Bennett was up to was the exact same thing that Joe was up to until Bennett decided to defect from the church. It's no coincidence that the term new and everlasting covenant doesn't make its colloquial appearance referring to polygamy until Bennett defected. That's how the leadership was able to distinguish its practice from the quote unquote spiritual wifery Bennett and apparently Higby and others were practicing. My point is, the practice of spiritual wifery in the New and Everlasting Covenant was the same. It was just called by different names. Chauncey was caught up in the meltdown, and he got burned, along with George W. Robinson, Sarah Pratt, Hinchman Sidney Rigdon, and a dozen other previously high-ranking members. Now, one interesting detail to tease out of the testimony from Sarah Miller is her implying that Bennett would perform abortions to hide the results of polygamy. Quote, Chauncey Higby said it would never be known. I told him it might be told in bringing forth, bringing forth is a euphemism for pregnancy. 
Chauncey said there was no danger and that Dr. Bennett understood it and would come and take it away if there was anything, end quote. You see, sometimes a trial is more important for the witness statements than the actual outcome of the trial. Now, notably, this was a high council tribunal. This is a disciplinary council, if you will. This was not held in the capacity of the Nauvoo Municipal Court for illegal or, you know, civil conduct, as that may require other witnesses to come forward and testify on behalf of Chauncey Higby, right? Instead, because this was a church court, only the prosecution was able to call witnesses and Chauncey Higby was excommunicated as a result. Coming out of this entire affair was actually also a Nauvoo Municipal Court proceeding. You see, the church court had excommunicated Chauncey Higby, and Francis Higby at this time remained unreprimanded. However, at the civil level, Joe decided to exert some force upon both Higby brothers for slander and defamation. Because Joe was king of Nauvoo, he prevailed in that case, and both Chauncey and Francis were fined $100 each. Now, a super interesting detail to come out of this lawsuit uh, judgment was a recognizance filed by Ebenezer Robinson. According to the filing, as long as Chauncey Higby appeared at the church tribunal for during which he was excommunicated, he wouldn't be held in contempt and wouldn't be responsible for paying the fine. I have never seen this before, but I'm sure it wasn't uncommon in Nauvoo. But essentially, Joe had filed a lawsuit against Chauncey L. Higby for slander and defamation, which resulted in a fine of $100. But if Chauncey didn't leave town and he showed up for his church tribunal in the high council to be excommunicated, then he wouldn't have to pay the fine. It's like bail, but the bond the person pays is going to a church disciplinary council. It's a crazy concept to me. Eventually, resulting out of this, Joe dropped the lawsuit, probably because he was in hiding for six months after the, he had filed the lawsuit and he couldn't attend any trials without running the risk of arrest by Illinois constables who would in, immediately extradite him to Missouri. Now, the remainder of 1842 and the majority of 1843, the Higbees sort of remain just kind of underneath the surface level of church history. Chauncey was excommunicated and therefore barred from anything of real consequence during that period. Francis, however, made it through the Bennett meltdown in good standing with the church. Francis didn't become the target of the character assassination campaign waged against Bennett and his cronies like Chauncey even though Francis had very clearly been corresponding with Bennett even more so than his brother Chauncey. While Francis had been aide-de-camp to Chauncey Bennett, Bennett's removal from the Nauvoo Legion left Francis without a job in the Legion. As a result, he was named aide-de-camp to another major general of the Nauvoo Legion. Now, the Joseph Smith Papers doesn't list who that specific major general was, but I suppose it would likely be William Law or another person of similar high rank uh, in the Nauvoo Legion who were still largely loyal to Joseph Smith in 1842. But the entire Bennett affair had left the taste of ash in the mouths of both Higby brothers. Their father, Elias Higby, at this time was called to be church historian and recorder. That actually happened prior to the Bennett meltdown. And it seems as if Elias had some hand in calming the contentious spirits of his sons. You see, after uh, the, the Bennett meltdown had happened, Francis moved 100 miles south of Nauvoo in late 1842. Francis wrote a letter to his father, Elias, quote, I want to understand that I have no feelings against Joseph. I have fully satisfied myself that he has been called of God and to do a great and mighty work in the earth. And let it suffice to say I am fully satisfied with him. All our former difficulties were forever effectually settled before I left, end quote. <laughs> Which is quite remarkable because Francis left town. He left town, be on hiatus from all of the drama that was happening with the Bennett meltdown. He left town. So apparently they had settled their affairs. They had buried the hatchet. 
Um, but what's quite notable is, uh, those tensions flared up repeatedly. Uh, also Chauncey Higby wrote to his father, Elias Higby a month after Francis did. And this is what Chauncey Higby said, quote, my object is not to vindicate or anathematize either party free from the shackles of party litigation. I desire peacefully to pursue the duties of my daily avocation while thankful for the boon. I hope long to remain a citizen of our flourishing city End quote. To put that into context though, I mean, right. It felt like Bennett had won. Joseph Smith was in hiding for the remainder of 1842 when both of these letters were written. Joseph Smith had evaded extradition to Missouri, but people were essentially under the assurance and understanding that Bennett had won and that Joe had learned his lesson. And in addition to that, both Francis and Chauncey had built their reputation and community in the Nauvoo kingdom. And the general threat by being dissenters of the church combined with, you know, some gentle pushes from their father, Elias... That resulted in both Chauncey and Francis taking, you know, more of a hands-off, kind of a distant approach to any church affairs. Chauncey Higby remained excommunicated, but Francis remained in active duty to the church, albeit with the cloud of distrust hanging over him. Anybody like Francis who worked with Bennett during 1842 was perceived as an enemy regardless of whether or not they had been officially disciplined by the high council. Both Francis and Chauncey bore that scarlet letter. The peace brokered between these brothers and the church leadership wasn't long for this world. Elias Higby, Chauncey and Francis's father, passed away suddenly in June of 1843 at the age of 47. Joe's journal for that day reads as follows, quote, this morning about daybreak, Elder Elias Higby died at his residence near the temple of cholera morbus inflammation and mortification. He was one of the temple committee, end quote. He was also historian for the church. He also saw a lot of things that, well, maybe we are not really privy to today. The funeral service for Eliza Higby uh, Eliza Higby, Elias Higby, <laughs> my mistake. The funeral service for Elias Higby wasn't held immediately. A few days after this entry, after Joe had visited Elias Higby on his deathbed, Joe traveled to Dixon, Illinois, to visit one of Emma's siblings living there and to preach the gospel all along the way. While Joe was in Dixon, Sheriffs Reynolds and Wilson arrested him with writs of extradition from Governor Ford of Illinois and Governor Reynolds of Missouri. Joe sent his personal secretary, who was along for the ride, William Clayton, or William Claypen as we call him, to get to Nauvoo as soon as possible and alert Hiram sidekick Abiff Smith that Joe had been arrested and was on his way to Missouri in custody of a Missouri constable. Hiram immediately called out the Danites masquerading as the Nauvoo Legion in order to rescue the prophet and the sheriffs were arrested by Joe's boys. It wasn't until late 1843 that this whole matter was actually resolved. But during that interim period, the funeral service for Elias Higby was held on August 13th and Joe's sermon contains some unique and cryptic signals, quote, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. I am not like other men. My mind is continually occupied with the business of the day, and I have to depend entirely upon the living God for everything I say on such occasions as these. The great thing for us to know is to comprehend what God did institute before the foundation of the world. Who knows it? It is the constitutional disposition of mankind to set up stakes and set bounds to the works and ways of the Almighty. We are called this morning to mourn the death of a just and good man, a great and mighty man. Had I inspiration, revelation, and lungs to communicate what my soul has contemplated in past times, there is not a soul in this congregation but would go to their homes and shut their mouths in everlasting silence on religion till they had learned something. 
Why be so certain that you comprehend the things of God when all things with you are so uncertain? You are welcome to all the knowledge and intelligence I can impart to you. I do not grudge the world of all the religion they have got. They are welcome to all the knowledge they possess. Where has Judge Higby gone? Who is there that would not give all his goods to feed the poor and pour out his gold and silver to the four winds to go where Judge Higby has gone? That which hath been hid from before the foundation of the world is revealed to babes and sucklings in the last days. The world is reserved unto burning in the last days. He shall send Elijah the prophet, and he shall reveal the covenants of the fathers in relation to the children, and the covenants of the children in relation to the fathers. Four destroying angels, holding power over the four quarters of the earth until the servants of God are sealed in their foreheads, which signifies sealing the blessing upon their heads, meaning the everlasting covenant, thereby making their calling and election sure. When a seal is put upon the father and mother, it secures their posterity so that they cannot be lost, but will be saved by virtue of the covenant to their father and mother, end quote. Okay, I I know. What what was he saying? It's cryptic. And if this wasn't cryptic enough, Joe's final words in the sermon are quite revealing. Quote, to the mourners, I would say, do as the husband and father would instruct you and you shall be reunited, end quote. Now, this was a mere month after the polygamy revelation had been given and presented to the high council. Any time that we see the terms new and everlasting covenant in this period of Nauvoo history, it's talking about the doctrine of sealing in the context of polygamy, right? There is no other available definition for that phrase from Nauvoo. Other mysterious and untimely deaths had occurred connected to polygamy, and Joe's funeral sermon for Elias Higby, reading so cryptically, can be viewed as such. Now, I'll readily admit how incredibly speculative it is that Elias Higby was killed for his opposition to polygamy, but I'm equally speculative in believing the same was the case for Don Carlos Smith, Joe's youngest brother, especially when Joe married his widowed sister-in-law only a month after Don Carlos' death. Who knows, if Joe had lived another year, he may have added Francis and Chauncey Higby's mom, Sarah Elizabeth Ward, to his harem. I don't know, right? But Joe wasn't done preaching that day, because after a few others had talked for a little bit, Joe got back on the stand, quote, I had forgotten one thing. We have had certain traders, not traitors, but traders, in this city who have been writing falsehoods to Missouri. Now, it says traders, maybe it actually meant traitors. Who knows? I mean, it's written down with contemporary notes. Somebody was taking it, writing it down as he was saying this. Maybe he actually meant traitors and they just recorded it as traders. Anyway, I'm going to read it as traitors. We have had certain traitors in this city who have been writing falsehoods to Missouri. And there is a certain man in the city who has made a covenant to betray and give me up to the Missourians. That man is no other than Sidney Rigdon. This testimony I have from gentlemen from abroad whose names I do not wish to give, end quote. Now, this is the day and the speech and the time when Hingepin Sidney Rigdon was excommunicated by Joseph Smith for his work with Bennett and the post office fiasco and for Nancy Rigdon and the shame that Joe felt around that and half a dozen other disagreements, which signaled that Joe and Hingepin Rigdon, uh, well, well, more than anything, it signaled to Joe that Rigdon wasn't a loyalist anymore, that he was not in the loyalist camp. He wasn't one of the, the howler monkey sycophants who was a fan of Joe, right? But the main issue here is that the Higby brothers were considered to be in league with Rigdon at this time because they had staked their claim with Rigdon and George W. Robinson during the Bennett meltdown. Francis Hippie and Nancy Rigdon were even close friends, possibly courting each other before Joe tried to rape her and Francis gave the happiness letter to Reckett Bennett. And Nancy Rigdon was understandably very angry with uh, Francis Higby for casting her name further into the public light by sharing so much with Bennett, including the happiness letter. But the fact remained that Joe considered Rigdon and Francis Higby both to be enemies. His speech at this time was aimed at Rigdon just as much as the implication was aimed at those that Rigdon was in conspiracy with, including Francis Higby. Also, I should add, Rigdon was excommunicated by Joseph Smith very briefly, but the High Council agreed to override 
Joseph Smith's excommunication of Cindy Rigdon. A month after this speech and during the same gathering of Elias Higby's funeral, Francis Higby sent a letter to Joseph Smith to try and be the bigger man and to try and move on from their disagreements and to try and bury the hatchet. Quote, My father's death has been enough when taken in connection with other things of less moment to engage my whole attention without seeking to draw down upon my own head the heads of my mother's family, another scourge such as we suffered in Missouri, who suffered more and hazarded life other oftener than did I. God forbid that ever I should be instrumental in bringing destruction not only upon my friends, but upon myself and my relatives. Then, sir, please read this or announce to the public that the charge with which I stand charged is false, 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 and greatly oblige, end quote. See, anybody connected with John C. Bennett, and this is, you know, more than a year after John Bennett had been excommunicated and removed as mayor, but anybody who had been previously connected with John C. Bennett was seen as a source of contention. They they were an embodied, a personification of the persecution that Joseph Smith was ranting against every single Sunday when he preached. Francis Higby was bearing the brunt of the accusations and of the persecution complex. Francis Higby was the enemy, and Joe repeatedly calling him out from the pulpit was bearing on Francis Higby. So Joe did oblige by inviting Higby over to a house party, and they apparently settled affairs very briefly, and Joe, quote, expressed himself satisfied that Colonel Francis Higby was free even of reproach or suspicion in that matter, end quote. And once again, this peace between Francis Higby and Joseph Smith was short-lived. By the very end of 1843, Joe was again distrusting of Francis Higby and ranting against him in high council meetings. Now, Joe had recommended that other young men should, quote, better withdraw from his, meaning Higby's, society and let him stand on his own merits. Higby had better be careful or a train of facts would be disclosed concerning him that he would not like, end quote. Francis had seen what happened to Chauncey Higby and the character assassination, how effective it was when Joseph Smith orchestrated a sharp campaign to destroy the character of somebody in Nauvoo. And Francis was sick of being targeted and knew, apparently, that Joe had some dirt on him, right? And now, the minutes of the meeting seem to tell only half the story because Francis Higby, in response to the meeting, fired off another letter to Joe, and it is absolutely dripping with venom from how Francis had been treated in such a petty way by the prophet. Quote, this is a long quote, but it's so, so good. The inconsiderate, the unwarranted, the unheard of attack you made upon my character before the city council impels me to demand an investigation of you and that without any delay before the ecclesiastical powers. For if I am guilty of either of those charges, omitting the guilt of the whole, I most unquestionably am not worthy a name among the people making as great professions as do the people called Mormons. It is said, I seek the hours of the midnight assassin to seize my victim when no one is near to bear witness of the crime or attest to the unhallowed deed, that I sympathize with the afflicted and oppressed, that I may devour their vitals, that I seek the mantle of religion to envelop my scorpion body, that I may better practice my nefarious designs. Then, sir, if I am acting in this sphere... Am I not acting in the sphere of a hypocrite? And am I not a dark body suffered a place in the fair escutcheon of our religion? In deciding this question, let us not sever the moorings of Christianity and plunge into the mad sea of revenge. Persuade the mariner to sell his compass or Washington his sword. Persuade an intelligent man to pluck out his eyes to enjoy the unmitigated horrors of blindness. Truth is our compass in the stormy sea of life. Truth 
shall arise like the angel on Manoah's sacrifice upon the flames of nature's funeral pyre and ascend to her source, her heaven and her home, the bosom of the holy and eternal God. Sir, you have struck a blow at everything which renders existence sweet. You have sought to blast every proud hope and every fond expectation by throwing into free circulation reports the truth of which God is someday to just. You have sought to blast every proud hope and every fond expectation by throwing into free circulation reports the truth of which God is someday to judge. As for the opinion which I always and still entertain with regard to the propriety of one man's having more than one woman or this spiritual business, I am not ashamed to avow in your presence or in the face and eyes of the world. I have repeatedly said and am still of the same opinion, fixed and determined as the polar star, that any revelation commanding or in any wise suffering sexual intercourse under any other form than that prescribed by the laws of our country and which has been ratified by special revelation through you is of hell. And I bid defiance to any or all such. As far as my character and influence extends, I am willing, not only willing, but determined to oppose it under every form it can present itself. Though the people should riot and protect an insurrection, the tyrants should rage and threaten destruction, though the hurricane should lay upon the bed of the sea, though the earthquake should tear the globe in pieces, though the stars should fall from their sphere and the frame of nature be dissolved, I know virtue will protect her votaries, while the good men will remain tranquil amidst the ruins of the world. Sir, I claim the right of investigation. I claim the right to a fair and impartial and public trial, and that without delay. From your mere ipsy dixit, I shall extricate myself. Forbear it, I will not. I am quite determined not to remain quiet under the foul imputation you cast upon me, end quote. Well, no public investigation into Joseph Smith was ever held because, of course it wasn't. Joe continued to rail against Francis Higby in private councils and make accusations that Francis Higby was trying to assassinate him, and that information eventually found its way back to old Frankie Boy through the gossip network of Nauvoo. Finally, Francis had enough and took a different strategy. A poem was published anonymously titled Buckeye's Lamentation for Want of More Wives. This poem details some important and very salacious details of Nauvoo polygamy and prostitution around town. Historian Gary Bergera postulates that this poem was actually written by Francis Higby, amid the pending Bostwick lawsuit for which Francis Higby was lawyer. It is an interesting assertion that Francis Higby wrote Buckeye's Lamentation for One of More Wives, but Bergera makes a strong case for it being Francis, and I'm inclined to agree with him. You'll find a link to his article in the show notes. Considering everything, everything, Francis had suffered because of Joe, resorting to subterfuge by way of this scathing poem must have been a cathartic outlet for Francis Higby. Now, the trial of Orsimus F. Bostwick is something we've talked about on the show before. Uh, Essentially, Bostwick claimed that Hiram's sidekick Abiff Smith was teaching plural marriage, and Hiram sued Bostwick for slander. Francis Higby was Bostwick's lawyer during the trial, and it was chaired by Mayor and King Joe, and it was, of course ruled in Hiram's favor, and therefore Bostwick was on the hook for a $50 fine. Francis Higby appealed the case to the circuit court at Carthage, which Joe said would bring the mob down upon us in his public speech, railing against Francis Higby once again. Luckily for Joe, he died before the appeal process was resolved, so it didn't really matter, did it? Spring of 1844 brought the Higby brothers, Chauncey and Francis, uh, Chauncey, <laughs> uh, Chauncey and Francis, Uh, The Foster Brothers that we discussed last week, Charles and Robert, and the Law Brothers, William and Wilson, which we'll discuss next week, into sharp focus as the most acute threats to the church. On March 24th, 1844, Joe preached from the pulpit, quote, 
I have been informed by two gentlemen that a conspiracy is got up in this place for the purpose of taking the life of President Joseph Smith, his family, and all the Smith family, and the heads of the church. Speaking in the third person, this is Joe from the, the pulpit. One of the gentlemen will give his name to the public, and the other wishes it to be hid for the present. They will both testify to it on oath and make an affidavit upon it. The names of the persons revealed at the head of the conspiracy to murder Joseph Smith, that's what he's saying, are as follows. Chauncey L. Higby, Dr. Robert D. Foster, Mr. Joseph H. Jackson, William and Wilson Law. And the lies that Chauncey L. Higby has hatched up as a foundation to work upon are, he says, that I had men's heads cut off in Missouri, that I had a sword run through the hearts of people that I wanted killed, maybe like his father, and put out of the way. I won't swear out a warrant against them, for I don't fear any of them. They would not scare off an old setting hen. I intend to publish all the iniquity that I know of them. If I am guilty, I am ready to bear it, end quote. But of course, if he's guilty, he's ready to bear it. But of course, Francis Higby repeatedly calling for a public and open fair trial and investigation into Joseph Smith. It never happened. It never happened. Joseph Smith would never submit to people testifying on the stand against him. Now, in that March 24th sermon, Francis Higby wasn't named directly in that list of conspirators to murder the prophet, but his long-running association and familial connection with those named, that implicated him as well, right? A week after this speech, Chauncey Higby accosted Joseph Smith on the street and Joe charged him with, quote, abusive, indecent, and threatening language, end quote, for which Chauncey was fined $10 plus court costs after his motion to dismiss was ignored by Joe's Banana Republic Municipal Court. Now, both Foster brothers became the target of the prophet's smear campaign as he entered the national stage to run for president. Now, Chauncey was with the Fosters when the marshal deputized all three of these men to assist him, that's John P. Green, the marshal, in the arrest of Augustine Spencer, and Charles Foster aimed a pistol at Joe's chest. During the fray, Chauncey Higby said, quote, I would be goddamned if I did not shoot you, meaning Joseph Smith. I would consider favored of God for the privilege of shooting or ridding the world of such a tyrant, referring to Joseph Smith, end quote. All three of these men, Robert D. Foster, Charles A. Foster, and Chauncey L. Higby, were arrested and fined $100 apiece. Chauncey Higby, Robert Foster, and Charles Foster appealed the decision to be taken to the circuit court in Carthage to be heard during the June session. Conveniently, when Hiram's case against Orsimus F. Bostwick was also scheduled to be heard in Carthage. Neither Joe nor Hiram survived for either of these hearings. After the judgment was made against these three men, including Chauncey Higby, Francis Higby was fed up. He sought final recourse for what he considered unrelenting and absolute tyranny. Francis Higby <laughs> filed a lawsuit against Joseph Smith for $5,000. $5,000. The fine that Joseph Smith would, you know, impose on people for slander, for defamation, they're usually 10 bucks, 50 bucks, 100 bucks. Francis filed a lawsuit for $5,000 for defamation and slander. <laughs> but, I mean, it's understandable, right? Francis had been so fed up with Joe's complete control of the court. Now, okay, control of the court, digression time. Some historians call what Joe did with the Nauvoo Municipal Court merely tampering, quote unquote, but that supposes that there was a baseline of fairness from which Joe just kind of tugged and pulled on occasion. I disagree. He was judge, jury, and executioner of, Nauvoo, of Nauvoo's court system. It was the Nauvoo Joe system, right? He didn't manipulate the system. He was the system. Francis had suffered from that fact for years, and he wasn't going to deal with it anymore. So he filed the lawsuit for defamation and slander for $5,000, and he filed it at Carthage instead of Nauvoo. Carthage 
was the county seat of Hancock County. That's the circuit court of Hancock County instead of the Nauvoo Municipal Court. That meant that a Carthage official had authority to arrest Joseph Smith and bring him to the circuit court there at the county seat in Carthage, which superseded the Nauvoo Municipal Court. Because that's how county court systems work. County court systems are a higher court to city court systems, right? So what did Joseph Smith do? Well, he allowed himself to be arrested by the Nauvoo Marshal, John P. Green, because Nauvoo ordinances dictated that this was legal. Joseph Smith was supposed to be arrested by a county marshal. Well, Nauvoo ordinances said that nobody could enter the city to arrest Joseph Smith, so he was arrested instead by John P. Green. And then he held a secret hearing, which granted him a writ of habeas corpus, and the case went away. Besides, if an officer from outside of Nauvoo entered the city with an intent of arresting Joseph Smith, another Nauvoo ordinance dictated that the person trying to arrest Joseph Smith would be arrested and imprisoned for life. Look, Joe was bulletproof, and Francis knew that more than anybody, so why he filed this lawsuit for $5,000 in damages, in many ways, maybe it was more of a symbolic gesture. That doesn't mean that it wasn't felt, because the Council of 50 meeting on May 6th contains a report by Hinchman Sidney Rigdon after he had met with the Laws, the Fosters, and the Higbees to see what was going on and gather intel. Quote, Elder Rigdon reported that he had had a labor with the Laws... Wilson and William Law, without accomplishing anything, but judged that they had taken a course which they would never become reconciled, that William Law said that if they would not buy out his property, etc., he would set up a press and go it to the death to get satisfaction. Rigdon found Chauncey Higby in his office. He manifested no bitter feelings, had nothing to do with the thing, and did not calculate to leave." Who knows if Chauncey Higby was telling Rigdon the truth there. Rigdon found Francis M. Higby at the landing. He seemed more stubborn than Chauncey. He said that they had addressed the governor who had received the charges and agreed to summon the court-martial. They had also preferred charges to the Masonic Grand Lodge of Illinois. There were a multitude of lawsuits. Francis M. Higby had two lawsuits, Wilson Law two, and William Law had some. There were some half-score lawsuits in all. The laws manifested a determination to go ahead. They would not retain a standing in the church and be still. Elder John Smith, that's Uncle John, that's Joe's uncle, right? Elder John Smith moved that we feel after the laws no more, but give them over to the buffetings of Satan. Buffetings of Satan in the council of 50 minutes. That means look for the first opportunity to get rid of these guys. Turn them in a catfish bait like we did, like we tried to do with Bennett. And then John Smith made that recommendation that uh, the laws will get rid of them. Joseph Smith, quote, decided that Foster and the Higbees were included in the last resolution and were all given to the buffetings of Satan, end quote. More assassination orders, the Fosters, the Higbees, and the laws. So where does that leave us? Exactly where we left off last week, this small entry in Joe's journal from May 7th, 1844, quote, an opposition printing press arrived at Dr. Robert D. Foster's from Columbus, Ohio, as report says, end quote. You see, the Higbees, all of them, were OG Mormons from the earliest Kirtland era of the church. The whole extended family of the Higbees, they were used, they were abused, they were driven from their homes multiple times maybe assassinated for their opposition to polygamy. They died from sickness and they generally suffered incredible amounts of abuse by Joseph Smith and his church. Elias and his sons were members of the church for over a decade before Chauncey was excommunicated for doing what Joe was doing, but doing it too publicly or without Joe's permission or something like that. Elias died. 
Francis fought the prophet in the court system repeatedly. The only way that us citizens have to right wrongs committed upon us by another citizen filed many lawsuits. But at the end of it all, what was the greatest sin that the Higbees committed? Following the rules. That was it. Look, like they followed the rules, the rules of law and the rules of culturally dictated monogamy. That was their slight against the prophet. <laughs> Should I say the one true prophet? They bent and bowed and knelt to the despotic system of the Nauvoo theocracy for years, and they tried and tried to make life work, but Joe was a weak human and considered them a threat at all times. And accordingly, Joe waged public square warfare against the Higbees repeatedly over and over. It was an endless campaign until he had successfully destroyed their characters and destroyed any opportunity that either brother had of finding a wife, right? And completely obliterated any familial and community relationships that they had formed. The Higbees filing lawsuits and speaking against the prophet. I mean, they were purely reactionary to Joe the tyrant flexing on people that he perceived as weaker in status than he was. Chauncey and Francis Higby fought long and hard to live in an equal society, but the simple fact remained that the deck was stacked against them. Society wasn't equal in the Nauvoo kingdom. No matter how hard they played, no matter how good their poker face, Joe always had a trick ace in his sleeve. People can only handle so much of this kind of abuse from a figure in power before they do something to flip the table and change the game. That's what we're witnessing in a very slow and grueling process. The Higbees, the Fosters, and the Laws they had gently placed their hands underneath the table in preparation of flipping the Mormon Empire game into complete and utter chaos. Hey, y'all. You heard it at the top of the episode. We have an upcoming event this April 19th in Salt Lake City, concerning psychedelics in early Mormonism and a tour of Gilgal Gardens. However, given the current trends related to COVID-19 or coronavirus, the organizers and myself have decided to postpone the event, not cancel it. So the FAA has issued travel restrictions on many countries to contain the spread, and the CDC has issued a number of guidelines to best protect people against infection. I live up here in Seattle with the nation's largest outbreak of the virus. And if actions in Seattle, uh, that Seattle as a city has taken is any sort of indicator of what other states will be doing in the coming months, the Salt Lake City Library probably isn't going to even be open for non-essential meetings for us to even hold the event um, if we didn't postpone it. So... All in all, I'm very disappointed with this development. However, I know that certain people are more vulnerable to being infected by this specific virus, and I don't want those people to be excluded from the event should their doctors or any federal agencies recommend that they don't attend something like this. The Utah Psychedelics Society, organizers, and myself, we explored ways that we could possibly hold the event, but none of them are going to work. So what does that mean for you if you've already bought your tickets? They're still going to be valid when the event happens. Like I said, this is just postponing, not canceling. So if you'd like a refund instead, that's no problem. The Eventbrite page will be updated to reflect this announcement and our postponing of the event this upcoming Ides of March weekend. So if you're looking forward to the lecture and the tour of the Gilgal Gardens and you know even the VIP dinner afterwards, I'm sorry, but this is the best decision, and trust me, I've weighed out a lot of different options in this. Uh, the risk of somebody actually becoming infected is very small, but I could not sleep at night knowing that I was responsible for somebody being infected due to a non-essential large community gathering. It's simply better to not take the risk and to hold the event at a later time when we have more information and risk of infection is lower. If Sunstone in Salt Lake City isn't canceled this year, 
um, or postponed, I'll go. I'll be presenting on psychedelics in occult traditions with my co-presenter Brian Kassenbrock, who will be presenting on entheogens in the Book of Mormon itself. That'll be, as always, the last week of July in 2020. So if you're interested, and once again, if Sunstone isn't canceled, you know, maybe consider attending that instead. I want to issue a thank you. This is to our long, long time listener and good friend of mine, Jay Mumford. He sent me a book that I cannot wait to dig into. I even used a, a little bit of it in order to help me for this episode. Uh, but the book is Nauvoo Kingdom, sorry, Kingdom of Nauvoo, uh, written by Ben Park. It was just recently published, and I'm really looking forward to reading through the book and hopefully getting Ben Park onto the podcast to uh, talk about his book because every <laughs> every historian that who I have seen has written reviews and uh, Facebook posts about this book show me that the book is really a fantastically well-written book. So looking forward to that, and I want to say thank you so much to Jay Mumford for always sending me stuff like this and for just being a very, very uh, devoted listener and a good friend of mine. Also wanted to do a little listener email. This came in from Dennis Anderson, and Dennis was actually responding to... Um, with the patron exclusive episode where we're reading through manuscript story, Conneaut Creek, the Solomon Spaulding manuscript that we have. And uh, this is briefly his email because it's something that I, I wasn't familiar with. I, I don't know the topic very well. Um, here's his email. He says a Greek astronomer named Arist Aristarchus, Aristarchus, I guess first proposed a helio heliocentric theory that was later discarded in favor of Arist Aristotle and Ptolemy's geocentric theories in the 1500s. Nikolai Copernicus, there's the first name that I actually know the, the, the first astronomer name that I actually recognize. Of course I recognize Aristotle and Ptolemy. Uh, Nikolai Copernicus published more evidence for a heliocentric model shortly before his death in 1543 then Giordano, Giordano Bruno challenged religious dogma of a geocentric universe with the scientific evidence and was convicted of heresy and burned at the stake in 1600. Catholicism is so great. Galileo was the first astronomer to use a telescope to study the heavens. He was ridiculed by Martin Luther, who stated that all Galileo needed to do is read the Bible where God stopped the sun from moving to allow Joshua enough time to conquer the city and kill the inhabitants. Galileo was tried for heresy, heresy in 1633 and found guilty. He faced death by torture on the rack. But the Pope, who was a friend of Galileo, intervened and told Galileo if he would recant his writings about a sun-centered model with the earth moving and not the sun, his sentence would be reduced to house arrest for the rest of his life. In 1992, the Catholic Church issued an apology to Galileo, and I'm sure he received that apology well. So Dennis signed his email Exmo since 1993. Um, so if you're wondering what that's in response to, <laughs> Manuscript Story Conneaut Creek had these brief expoundings on the geocentric versus the heliocentric models, which was pretty fascinating to me that they were just kind of included by the author apropos of absolutely nothing. And that was just a really fun response to kind of lay out a brief timeline of the heliocentric models because I, I kind of fumbled around because I didn't know this information. Uh, and I want to say thank you to Dennis for uh, for elucidating that and putting it <laughs> in just a one one page email that I could very easily understand. So thank you so much to Dennis for that. We also do have a new patron over at patreon.com slash naked Mormonism. This is from Scott. So Scott, thank you so much for joining the show and pledging to support and joining the ranks of the Nemo Outer Darkness. If you'd like to join the ranks that Scott just joined, you can do so patreon.com slash naked Mormonism. You can gain access to extended editions of every new episode and a bunch of, new, of episodes in the backlog that are extended editions as well. You also get an extra episode every week. We're reading through our name of book club. And more importantly, you get us closer to our goal of starting a Mormon history themed D&D &D campaign. So if you want to do that, patreon.com slash naked mormonism but hey if you're not gonna do that um that's totally fine if you are somebody who can't afford you know a, a, a buck an episode a couple bucks an episode a coffee a month or a combo meal a month or whatever the case is 
if that's something that is not feasible for you, which I completely understand, then, hey, uh, you know, share the show. Let, let a friend know and, and, you know, tag me in a, a post when you're talking about Mormon history stuff in, on Facebook, Twitter, or on Reddit. And uh, I, I usually chime in. So with that, I want to say thank you all to all you listeners. Hey, you hit the download button, you listen to the end of the episode, and I really do appreciate it. And I hope to talk to you next time here on the Naked Mormonism Podcast. Podcast is produced with the help of Julie Briscoe as social media manager and Brian Ziegenhagen as audio engineer. Music is written and produced by Jason Camo of a lost state of mind.bandcamp.com and used with permission. Legal counsel is provided by Andrew Torres of the Law Offices of P. Andrew Torres in the Opening Arguments podcast. Naked Mormonism is a production of Ground Gnomes LLC. Copyright 2020. All rights reserved.